let's get started. Welcome, 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 welcome everyone to the fifth quarterly New York City Agency Commitment Update and the first of 2024 hosted by the Gowanus Oversight Task Force. I'm Ben Margolis with James Lima Planning and Development, the Task Force's facilitation team. My colleagues Kweku, Isabella, and another Ben, Ben Ratner, are here to help everybody and the meeting flow. Um, please raise your hand if this is your first task force experience. <laughs> Great, plenty, fantastic, okay. Um, well, thank you, and thank you also to the administration of, and the faculty and students of uh, PS133 for sharing their space, Whole Foods for the water and snacks, and RealWorks, uh, a nonprofit right here on President Street in Gowanus, uh, for the audio and video tonight, it is a nonprofit uh, that combines art education and workforce development and trains young adults in media and production. So, in fact, can those young adults please raise their hand and maybe we give them a round? Please. Okay, some quick logistics. The meeting is being recorded. That recording, along with a Spanish translation of the transcript and the present presentation materials, will all be made available on the task force website, which is GowanusTaskForceOneWord.net. If you haven't already picked it up, there is a meeting packet, or you can scan the QR code, and in there is information about uh, uh, tonight's uh, uh, focus and a full list of the city's 56 commitments which on the website are explained in even more detail. The task force has structured these public meetings to focus on two things. One is engagement and education with the public. Uh, the other is making sure we do deeper dives and deeper discussions with agency partners about city commitments that, and issues that are really of community interest and are timely. So tonight the task force chosen to set into motion and a discussion on a set of commitments around the Gowanus Green development, which is slated to create one third of the rezoning area's future affordable units and provide pivotal amenities and remediation for the community. So we'll be hearing directly from city agencies leading on the related commitments, plus a welcome to a state agency, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. I think the number of participants in tonight's meeting gives you a sense of the complexity of this project and this development. So this is how things will roll. Uh, to keep us below two hours, we have allotted specific times for updates with committees and two breaks for discussion. One Q&A dedicated to the components of the project. So it's housing, agency coordination, the planned park, the future school site, and one Q&A dedicated uh, just to site remediation and to monitoring. Out of the 60 minutes total for the agency updates, there should be about 40 to 45 for public Q&A. And when we get to the Q&A uh, and the, and the uh, discussion turns to you, the audience, we'll alternate questions between those written on note cards. So hopefully you pick some up. If you need some, let us know and uh, those who feel confident enough to ask questions live. Uh, we have two mobile microphones, some really important guidance, as this is a working task force meeting, questions relating to the specific topic and city commitments being presented will definitely be prioritized. Please ask uh, one question at a time, not in five parts, and let's just collectively do our best to be respectful for your uh, fellow community members, who are here to engage and to learn. Um, all questions, I should say, whether out loud or submitted on a note card are gonna be posted on the task force website within two weeks of tonight. So if you don't get to ask a question, please, please, please write it down on a note card or you can send it, and I'll go back, you can send it to info at gowanustaskforce.net. We'll show this information a couple more times tonight. Uh, for those who are new to its work, a really quick look at the task force. It's made up of 33 community volunteers, 
many of you hopefully met on the way in tonight or have met before. After a decade of planning and advocacy, creating oversight on city commitments was a major, major community priority during the rezoning process. And this task force was commitment number one of the 56 commitments that were made to this community uh, after the rezoning. And a full list is in your packet and on the website in more detail. This is certainly a unique model of community oversight and engagement, and it works under the crazy assumption that the community and the city, with strong support of elected officials, can actually work proactively and productively to solve inevitable issues and advance promises and projects in Gowanus. And in Gowanus, we're working to solve many issues and advance $450 million worth of commitments and investments promised to the community, including $200 million for priority capital improvements at Gowanus Houses and Wyckoff Gardens. So when you take all these 56 commitments together, they truly hold the potential to positively impact quality of life for decades to come. They're multifaceted. They're complex, they often require great agency coordination, and many are on different timelines, some of which are implemented over years into the future. So the task force works to track all 56 of those commitments. Agency updates are available on the commitments page of the website, and those uh, will be updated within two weeks of tonight, and we'll send a notification when that happens. Some quick recent updates for those who attended previous quarterly uh, meetings, recordings of minutes of which are also always on GowanusTaskForce.net. Uh, quickly, the Department of Youth and Community Development, DYCD, shared that the Gowanus Community Center plans to reopen for programming this summer in July 2024. This milestone is nearly two decades in the making. So thanks to the Housing Committee, but thanks especially to NYCHA Resident Advocacy. Um, and DYCD, I understand, hosted an information session last night, and they'll do two more in April and May. So very good news there. Um, on its commitment to design and deliver workforce training for local residents, the Department of Small Business Services, SBS, released a request for proposal, an RFP, for a recruitment partner to help a minimum of 150 eligible Gowanus Community Board 6 and NYCHA residents to enroll in a minimum of six training cohorts. The proposal due date was actually February 5th, so the Economic and Workforce Committee of the Task Force will certainly be working with SBS on an update. Uh, the first phase of work to expand sewer capacity and provide relief to the chronic flooding at 4th and Carroll is scheduled to be completed by DDC in the second quarter of 2024. The work is on 7th Street between 3rd and 4th Avenues, and the agency believes that work will certainly increase capacity uh, significantly. The second phase of work at the Head End CSO facility began in March 2023. In September, crews began building the concrete support walls that will enable the deep excavation required to build the tank. The MTA land transfer agreement with Parks is now complete. This is a big step forward for a promenade and waterfront connection becoming a reality. And uh, less of a update and more of a call to arms. Public bathrooms, as we heard during our session on waterfront amenities, there is a need. There's a need to identify sites for public bathrooms along the canal. Uh, the Parks Department is developing various tools to incentivize developers, but we as a community can certainly help and advocate, so more to come on that. So let's get rolling tonight and hear an overview of the Gowanus Green Development and new affordable housing, planning for the waterfront park, the school site and the process for planning for new schools, and site remediation and monitoring HPD, then parks, the School Construction Authority, and Department of Education, and then the State Department of Environmental Conservation. Questions might come to you as you listen, right, to each session and each presentation, just a reminder prepare on your card or prepare to ask live questions about this specific set of commitments and focus area under discussion. Thanks. 
Okay. Housing Committee, would you like to introduce yourselves and frame this discussion a little bit? Sure. Hello all, my name is Bahish Chansey. I'm here on behalf of the Housing Committee of the Gowanus Task Force. I'm a local resident and I'll pass it down for introductions. Hi everyone, my name is uh, Monica Underwood. I'm from Wycliffe Gardens. Hi everybody, Michelle Delahouz, um, member of the Housing Committee, Executive Director of the Fifth Avenue Committee and also one of the members of Gowanus Green. Hi, I'm Ariel Krasnow, one of the co-chairs of the Housing Committee with Vi Mae Richardson, who I believe uh, is not in town tonight, but um, is going to be watching later. And Nilda is also um, out of town, but we, we are, everybody was very much involved in um, helping to prepare for this evening. Thank you, and good evening, Gowanus. How are you doing? All right, folks, so we're here on behalf of a larger committee, and we are very excited to welcome both Alina and Hala from the City's Department of Housing Preservation and Development, HPD, to share an update on the construction of Gowanus Green with us today. The major effect of the Gowanus rezoning has been a significant increase in the number of homes that can be constructed in the neighborhood, and the mandate that these new buildings include at least 25% income-restricted, permanently affordable homes through the city's mandatory inclusionary housing program, and an additional 1,000 homes that are 100% affordable through Gowanus Green and Mercy <coughs> Homes. This comes when our city is witnessing historically low vacancy rates and skyrocketing rents. Uh, for the most affordable homes, which rent below $1,100 per month, the 2023 housing vacancy survey in the city found less than one half of 1% 1 of those homes are available to renters. Overall, the new developments in Gowanus are projected to bring 8,500 much needed new apartments of which 3,000 will be affordable. This six building Gowanus green development represents nearly one third of all those affordable apartments with 950 units. 100% of those units in Gowanus green will be income capped. This includes some apartments that will be deeply affordable in, a, in addition to including supportive housing, mixed income buildings, a building set aside for older adults, and affordable home ownership opportunities. The project also represents an impressive coordination effort across city agencies to deliver new public school, a new public school facility, a new city-owned public park along the water, and, a new, and new public streets. We are now pleased to turn it over to HPD to provide a full update on the project to the public today. Great, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you for having us. My name is Hala Sala, and I'm the Deputy Director for Brooklyn Planning at HPD. Um, and I'm joined tonight with my colleague, Alina Farishta, who is the Director of Brooklyn Planning. And we are pleased to come here tonight and provide updates on this truly transformative project known as Gowanus Green. Um, so as many of you um, may be aware, there was a neighborhood-wide rezoning that was approved in 2021. Um, and this was for a comprehensive plan that identified the needs and opportunities to support a long-term vision of a sustainable, inclusive, and mixed-use Gowanus neighborhood. So the plan um, had predicted a creation of approximately 3,000 affordable homes, and um, roughly 32% of those projected units will be delivered on this site through the Gowanus Green project. The Gowanus Green site, um, shown here in red, um, is a city-owned site and is the really only significantly city-owned um, affordable housing site within that rezoning boundary. Uh, it's bounded by Fifth Street to the north, Smith Street to the west, and the Gowanus Canal to the east. Um, and it's also well serviced by transit. As you can see on the map, it's about equidistant from both the Carroll Street and the Smith Street um, F and G train stations. So several agencies uh, really play a part in the development of this site, um, and there's a lot of moving pieces. So I know a lot of us, a lot of the representatives are here tonight, and we're gonna provide um, our own updates, but I just wanted to spend some time showing how each city agency contributes to the overall plan. 
Um, so the Gowanus Green site, it's, it's a very large site. It's roughly 5.6 acres. Um, and it's been, it will be developed over time with continued agency coordination. So this site is currently under the City of New York ownership under the jurisdiction of the Department of Housing, Preservation and Development, HPD. And HPD, in partnership with the development team, will be responsible for the residential buildings, which are shown in yellow on this map above me. Um, the site plan would also provide two new streets, which are shown in orange, um, which the Department of Transportation, DOT, will eventually assume ownership um, of those public streets. The Department of Parks and Recreation will be responsible for the design of the public park, shown in green. And then the School Construction Authority, SCA, is responsible for the planning and construction of the school, shown in blue. And then the Department of Education would be responsible for the school's operation. Also noting that there is coordination with the Department of Environmental Protection, DEP, for all the necessary infrastructure underneath the site. And remediation will also be completed across the entire site, which is overseen by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and the United States Environmental Protection Agency, um, which will be further discussed in the second half of this agenda. Um, lastly, I also just want to note that the Gowanus Green site was selected to participate in the Climate Resiliency Design Guidelines Pilot Program, which is um, overseen by the Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice uh, to ensure that the city projects are prepared for future climate change. So narrowing in on what is Gowanus Green going to deliver. Um, this development is going to be a sustainable mixed-use community um, along the Gowanus Canal that will feature six new buildings, a site for a 80,000 square foot school, a 1.5 acre public park, and the build out of new streets. Due to school safety concerns, the shared street concept along Laqueer Street will be reserved to the western portion of the site, and a pedestrian plaza will now be in the front of the future school. The Gowanus Green development will deliver approximately 955 affordable homes, of which roughly 110 of those rental units will be for seniors, approximately 50 supportive units, and about 60 home ownership units. The proposed development will also include approximately 28,000 square feet of commercial or community facility uses on the ground floor, fronting either Smith Street or the newly built Laqueer Street. Um, Gowanus Green will be a multi-phased development and would provide these six new buildings utilizing a variety of HPD programs to finance the construction of these affordable homes within the neighborhood. HPD understands the urgency and the need for new housing in the area and across the city and um, we are actively working with our city partners and the development team to deliver this much needed units in a timely manner. Gowana Screen um, will be developed in two main phases. You can see here the, the blue and the purple um, that's split in the half of the site. Each phase is then further divided for each building to have its individual financial closing, starting from the northwest of the site and then moving east towards the canal. So phase 1A will be the first of the development and would consist of building A, which fronts on Smith Street at the corner of Fifth. Building A will be a mixed-use building up to 10 stories, providing approximately 191 affordable units, and it will be utilizing our mix-and-match program um, with approximately 6 to 8,000 square feet of retail at the ground floor on Smith Street. Additionally, the city was named as an awardee for the Restore New York Communities Initiative Grant um, by the New York State Empire State Development. Um, which will provide municipalities with financial assistance for the revitalization of commercial and residential properties. So the grant will really help us expedite our construction timeline and assist in the delivery of these affordable units. And HPD is currently assessing the feasibility of this financial closing for Building A um, to be at the end of 2024. 
So one of the items that I really want to highlight about Go On a Screen is that this site is 100% affordable housing. Um, but what exactly does it mean to be affordable and how do we calculate it? So the Federal um, Housing and Urban Development Agency, HUD, um, creates these income limits each year to guide the distribution of housing funds across the country. These income limits, they're set by HUD, and you may hear them also referred to as AMIs, or Area Median Incomes, um, but they don't actually represent the average income of the area, but rather the average cost of the available rental housing. So for New York City's region, the AMI for a family of three is um, currently set at $127,000. Um, this is also what we would, we would define as 100% AMI, um, which is kind of the base calculation of how affordability levels are set. So if we say something is 60% of AMI, um, we're really taking 60% of that $127,000, so that'd be roughly $76,000 um, for a family of three. So this slide really just shows some examples of what it means at the various AMI levels and um, how it changes based on your household size as well. So for example, a single person household at 30% AMI would be roughly $30,000. A three person household at 80% AMI is $101,000 and then a two-person household at, let's say, 120% AMI would be $135,000. Um, but I also want to note that a majority of HPD's projects serve families that are in between that zero to 80% AMI range, um, but we do have rental programs that also serve up to 120% of AMI. So what does that mean for Go On a Screen? Um, for the site, um, I just want to quickly also note that our perspective of the site plan has shifted. So it's been shifted 180 degrees. We're now looking at it from the northwest corner viewpoint um, instead. So make that note. Um, but this site will include um, various affordable housing programs um, from low income to mixed income, um, senior, supportive, and home ownership, um, which will really connect and serve the larger Gowanus neighborhood and the city. Um, across the site, HPD is committed to at least approximately 450 of those units um, to be for, are dedicated for very low income households, um, averaging at or below 50% AMI, so that would be roughly $63,000 for a family of three. Um, and then no more of approximately 360 of those units will be for moderate um, and middle income. So then we're also having each of the buildings will be utilizing um, our different housing programs, and I'll in the subsequent slides go through what each of those programs are. Um, but they'll be financed um, at the exact unit mix and affordability mix will be based on the terms of each of those programs at the time of closing. So um, like I said, I'm going to spend some time going through each of the buildings and their intended program. Um, buildings A and B um, would collectively provide 491 homes and would utilize the mix and match program. This program funds new mixed income multifamily rental buildings with a portion of the apartments geared to low income households and the remaining for moderate or middle income households. This program also requires 15% of the units be set aside for formerly homeless individuals. Building C would be utilizing HPD's extremely low and low income affordability program, also known as ELLA, um, which funds the low income multifamily rental buildings. Um, the terms for this program require that a minimum of 80% of the units be affordable to low income households earning up to 80% AMI. So again, that's roughly $101,000 for a family of three. 
Um, and then up to about 20% of the units would be moderate income and 15% set aside for um, formerly homeless individuals. So for Building C, um, it's going to provide approximately 208 units. Moving on for Building D, which would be utilizing and built under the Supportive Housing Loan Program, which makes low interest loans to support the development of permanent supportive housing with on-site social services. This program also provides homes for low-income households um, with incomes earning up to 60% AMI. Currently, Building D is contemplated to have approximately 81 units, of which 49 would be for formerly homeless disabled individuals and 31 for low-income households. Building E. Um, we'll use HPD's Senior Affordable Rental Apartments program, the SARA program, which makes low interest loans to support the construction of affordable housing for seniors aged 62 years and older with incomes up to 60% AMI. So again, that's about $76,000 for a family of three. Um, however, homeless set-aside units may serve households with at least one person who's 55 years or older. So for Building E, um, this will provide approximately 112 senior affordable units. And for the last residential building on the site, we have the Open Door Program, um, which funds the new construction of co-op or condo buildings for affordable to um, that are affordable to moderate and middle income families for home ownership opportunities. So building F will be providing approximately 63 home ownership units to the site. Um, so lastly, go on a screen will really serve as a model of sustainability and efficiency for other affordable housing developments in the city by integrating rigorous green design principles at both the building but also site-wide levels. So the buildings will incorporate all electric design, targeting certifications beyond the required levels. The buildings will include high performance insulation to reduce mechanical and heating loads along with efficient HVAC systems to minimize energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. Renewable energy sources such as solar panels will be integrated to further reduce the reliance on fossil fuels. And moreover, the buildings will use only low or no VOC paints, coatings, primers, sealants, and adhesives. At a site level, the development will implement a range of stormwater management strategies to minimize the combined sewer overflows into the city's sewer system including permeable paving, planted areas, um, enhance a number of green spaces with paths throughout the site, and also minimizing the demand of those water resources. The project is also participating, as I mentioned earlier, in the city's climate resiliency design pilot program, um, which will demonstrate the positive impact of these resiliency measures against future climate-related hazards. So overall, Gwanis Green's comprehensive approach to environmental sustainability will serve as a model for future developments and directly responds to the goals of the neighborhood plan um, to promote a more sustainable built environment. So that now concludes our presentation and we can take any questions. Great, many, many thanks. Um, we have time for two committee questions and then we're gonna bring the Parks Department up. Okay. <clears throat> My question was, um, will they be taking Section 8? Yes. Section 8 vouchers, correct? Yes. Yes, yes there will be um, project-based Section 8 vouchers that um, are extremely limited resources um, that are supplied at a federal regulated level. Um, but they are one of the many tools that HPD will be utilizing to support um, affordable housing in this project.
And I'll, sorry, just to add to that also really quickly is that HPD will evaluate the appropriateness of those vouchers at each closing for each building. So we'll have more information at each closing time. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that the phase one was going to hopefully close 2024. That's your timeline. Can you just um, uh, talk a little bit to the, the coordination between that timeline and the rest of the um, activity then and, and um, work that has to go on at the site? Sure. So yes, um, building A is, is the first of um, the buildings that will be closing. Um, we are targeting um, this year. Um, as I mentioned, we were lucky enough to be awarded the grant um, from the Empire State Development, um, which does tie us to a certain timeline to start construction. Um, and in terms of the full site, you know, every building will close when it's ready and financially able to, starting with the first building, which fronts on Smith Street. Um, but there is a lot of other coordination, as I was mentioning, with different agencies that we'll need to continue to work through um, as we phase out the rest of the project. Does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> More to come for sure. Okay, thank you, HPD partners and housing committee. Let's do uh, if if actually if the public Q and A for this section will happen after Parks, the School Construction Authority, and Department of Education present. But if you have any HPD specific questions on your note cards, hold them up, and people will come collect them, and we'll start collecting them here. But then we'll the, but hold your hold your live questions for now because we're going to do continue to do agency updates. So if we can do a quick change, feel free to knock your committee members over to get to the table. Uh, agency, same. Parks Department, Open Space Committee, come on up. Thank you. Hi, Open Space Hi. Waterfront Committee. You want to frame the discussion a little bit? Sure. Do you want us to do it, Chris? Absolutely. Thanks. Okay, sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Celeste LeCompte. I'm a Gowanus resident and a member of the Gowanus Dredgers Canoe Club. Hi, I'm Lisa Lightbody. I uh, live in Gowanus. Just make sure you speak directly in the mic. Yep. Um, my name is Lisa Lightbody, and I live in Gowanus. My name is Diana Gruberg. I work at Guanas Canal Conservancy. I'm Candelaria Mas, and I'm also a nearby resident and an architect and urban designer in this team. All right, so um, I don't have a very long introduction here, but we are very excited tonight to hear from Parks today about their work on the Guanas Green site. The rezoning is intended to open up a significant amount of new open public space throughout the neighborhood, both alongside and on the water. Uh, Gowanus Green is home to the largest park plan within the area and has significant connections up and down the waterfront and also therefore many dependencies. Uh, it also represents a significant opportunity to provide many of the benefits and services that the community requested throughout the rezoning. Um, this includes amenities like public bathrooms and boat access, as well as others to be developed in consultation with the community. That's all of us. So with that being said, I will turn it over to Parks for their presentation. Thank you for that introduction. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Arnish, and I'm joined by Davey Ives, and we're from the Parks Department. And I think we're both really excited and maybe a little nervous to be here. So that's a really <laughs> good place to be. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, I just did our introductions. Um, this is the site, what do you think, huh? Uh, but it, it does, I mean, if you do, just I'm gonna uh, abandon my script for a minute. If you get a chance to sneak out on the site and you see the wide open sky and you get to the water's edge, you'll know why we're all here. Um, but before we get into the park details, 
a really quick rundown on the timeline, which I think by this point, it's kind of like the Haggadah in a Seder. We all know it by now. Uh, 2007, they reduced, the, the city released an RFP for development of what was once known as public place. And that it, in, the, in that RFP, it included um, a waterfront park. It was an integral part of that RFP, along with the housing. Um, I think we know where the site is, Smith and, and, and Fifth. Um, and then fast forward a couple of years later, in 2020, there was a little uh, change in plans, and we think of a very uh, bold change in plans. Um, it switched from a mixed income development to 100% uh, affordable. Um, so that, that obviously the you know changes some things. Um, and then in 2007, uh, I'm sorry, 2021, um, we really get to the commitments of building out both Gowanus Green and the parks. And, and like, I'll do a run of the numbers. Um, we got an al allocation of $14.4 million to build the park. We got a commitment to, to map that property as parkland, that one and a half acre space. It, that means it's par um, mapped in, in perpetuity as parklands, which is really the highest standard of protecting that property. And um, we got a commitment, you know, the city, we, we you know, they're, they're, when you bring on new parks, you, knew, you need to ensure resources for maintenance. So, you know, the city said, we're either, we're gonna figure out a way forward, right? We know that the, the, the mechanism that existed before where we might get funding through the development has changed. So the city said, we're gonna, we're gonna figure out a way to either do it through the, um, through the developer um, with some city funding or uh, through the, the business improvement district, which is in, in formation. Um, and then the POA, the points of agreement, um, says uh, design will start in 2025 and construction will start in 2027. And I'm really happy to announce that I think we're gonna meet that target. Um, so yeah, so it looks like we're a year off from the start of design, so fingers crossed. Um, but to get, to get more into the meats and you know the, the meat of the issue, uh, the park is a critical nexus for all that's going on with the Gowanus Waterfront Access Plan, and the plan is we're knitting together public properties, um, Gowanus Green, um, the uh, Bond Street End, which is in the northern portion of this diagram and uh, the 9th Street, um, Smith and 9th Street property, which you, you already heard that we now have, the city now has control of. Um, but in addition to that, we have street ends and we have the private development parcels. So the, the, the park at Gowanus Green will connect with the private development site, the waterfront public access area, uh, 459 Smith Street, directly to the south. And then we have like a whole kind of interesting kind of connections. That site will connect with 300 Huntington, which is now open and y'all can go stroll it and see it's really beautiful. And then eventually that will connect with um, the, new, the Smith and 9th Street Transit Plaza. The north, north of the park, um, you can see that we have like a, we have a little gap there. So we don't, the, the development of those properties are, are still unknown at this point in time. But we do believe if those properties do become um, advanced and, and undergo conversion, that eventually the waterfront public access area, and including Gowanus Green Park, will connect all the way with the Bond Street end. So that's you know a really nice weaving together of both public and private properties. So as I mentioned at the, the beginning of, my, of this discussion, um, that the park was always envisioned part and parcel with the larger um, development. Um, and, and having you know having the park and the mix, mixed use development come together creates um, it's um, there's imp great opportunities and and the park is actually important to the the upland development as well. Um, first off, we're going to provide a playground for the school. Schools in New York State are mandated that they have to have outdoor play, so we're able to provide that. We have this model known as the jointly operated properties. Um, you've probably stood in one and not even known it, right outside MS-51. Uh, Boren Park, just north of here, is also a jointly operated property. So we have, we know that if, when the, you know, when the school comes online, we'll be able to provide that playground. Um, the green, the, uh, the siting of green infrastructure of, that's serving the development will go through our park. That's another thing that we do often all with um, our sister agencies. Infrastructure runs through parks. In this case, um, some of that, that green infrastructure will um, manage our stormwater runoff as well. So it's kind of a win-win. And then the kind of the, the one that 
at, at the beginning of um, at the very beginning of the meeting, we 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 asked for a call to action on bathrooms, and I don't. And it's always kind of awkward to say that, but um, yes, we need your help on bathrooms. Um, we have this, you know, we've been kind of flirting with this new concept of building bathrooms within development sites um, that serve a park, and we're seeing we've seen this. Um, in, in Hunter's Point in Queens. Um, if you know the Long Island um, LIC Boat Club, um, they have, a, a, they have a, a boathouse and they also provide a public bathroom. Um, in the site that's shown in the lower right, um, that's um, Evelina Antonetti in the Bronx and that's uh, on Grand Cor Concourse. And there's an adjacent development, which I believe was built by HPD, which per provides a bathroom. And, and, and it's kind of a win-win because you know, we have such precious, you know, precious open space. And to put a building in, in a park, yes, bathrooms are important, but if we can tuck it into another building, there's significant cost savings. And it also reserves more of that space for recreational or, um, you know, for park purposes. So we, we think that's a win-win. A um, so yeah, we need your help on bathrooms. Um, so oh, I'm gonna, I skipped ahead here. Okay, so as mentioned, um, this is the alphabet soup of, of uh, park coordination. We are working with HPD, DOT, DEC, EPA. There's a lot going on. And you can see we, with each one of our partners, um, we ha they, ha they have a piece of the park. Um, so there's a lot of coordination that's gonna, you know, to, uh, um, that needs to take place among the agencies before we can get to the design. And I think the, 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 the kind of the most crucial one for the parks department is we need to know where the streets are um, that abut the park. So um, we'll be in very close coordination with the development team and DOT. Where are those streets? Because once we know that, then we know where, how, to, how to slot in our, in our, um, our park. Um, but in terms of the park capital pro, uh, design pro, pro, uh, project, um, it's basically four phases, there's pro project initiation, that's kind of like leading up to like doing, you know, getting the, the site information and borings, et cetera. Um, design, and I have that highlighted here because I think that's the, the, bu the bucket that all of you are very interested in. And then there's procurement and construction. Um, but we're gonna focus more on design this evening. Um, so the design of, uh, to be clear, the design of this park, we have not started. There's no secret plan anywhere. We have not started design. Um, but that we do know that there are two chief priorities in the, in the park program. One is boat access and storage, and the other is public bathrooms. So that we know that, you know, on the onset, we're gonna make sure that our scope can include those items. Um, and then there's other items that we've heard through meetings uh, such as the task force or during the rezoning, um, a dog run, um, and playgrounds with courts. Um, and then there's also the whole palette of our of park programs, um, adult uh, fitness equipment, um, seating, a skate park. Again, none of this has been decided, but we just want, if you want to whet your appetite, you can see these are some of the things that we may contemplate. Um, but in terms of, we were to, you know, let, let's look at the um, considerations for the boat access at Gowanus Green. There are two things we're looking at. One, the bulkhead. Now, if you look at the one image, you can see that we have um, steel plate bulkhead that I believe is EPA mandated. And so there's some challenges about putting, when you have that kind of infrastructure, marine infrastructure, if we're gonna put in a, a boat launch, we're either gonna have to go over it or through it. And I like the option that where we go through it. Now, again, this is just you know illustrative. Um, but just to kind of get, get the juices flowing, that, that is something that we're gonna have to consider. And when we talk about puncturing the bulkhead, that we, I don't even know if that's within the realm of possibilities, but I think it's important to ask and what would that take? And then the other image on the, on the bottom is boat storage. And this is in a park in Queens that just opened. And it's just a really elegant little solution that racks and uh, a bit of a shelter. Um, to show you um, how we could store boats um, for the, the Gowanus Green um, boat launch. And then um, the, the other issue that I kind of alluded to at the beginning is that when you bring a, a new park online, co commensurative with that new asset is um, resources for maintenance and operation. 
And right now we're still kind of figuring that out, but I just wanted to give the, uh, the committee members and members of the public an idea of what that entails. And there's you know four broad categories, and Davey, feel free to, to chime in, um, but we're talking about daily cleaning, um, snow removal, which you don't know how much the agency spends on snow removal. It's, an enormous, it's just an enormous task that you don't even think about it. Um, landscape maintenance of our, our plants and repair and replacement of you know pavement, furnishings, fixtures, things of that nature. Um, so I, I think that's it um, for me. And I, again, I'm really excited to be here. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, questions from the committee? No? Okay, we're a little behind, so let's do the switch one more time. And then we'll get to public Q&A. So School Construction Authority, Department of Education, and the Public Infrastructure Committee, please come to the front. Great. And if you have parks-related note cards as well, um, you can hold those up and we'll collect those in the time being. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Leslie Duvall. I'm a Gowanus resident. We're the Public Infrastructure Committee. My name is S.J. Avery. I live a block away from here, and I'm co-chair of 4th on 4th Avenue. Hi, I'm Johnny Thornton. I'm the executive director of Arts Gowanus. And we have a couple of other members who are in the, in the audience or, or not here tonight. Um, I'm just going to very quickly frame uh, this uh, portion of the meeting. Um, so while we know the siting and the construction of a new school in Gowanus may be several years away and there's lots of steps that need to happen with multiple agencies, uh, we felt that it was an important time to talk about the commitments related to the school at the Gowanus Green. Um, the SCA and the DOE have committed under the rezoning points of agreement to build a school at Gowanus Green as we've seen um, in anticipation of community need. But meanwhile, um, we're all seeing buildings go up, uh, big residential buildings go up um, on, along 3rd and 4th, Hoyt and Bond, directly adjacent to the canal. So we therefore thought it was a good time to talk about schools and to help the community better understand the process for evaluating current and future needs, uh, seat needs, at the school and the district level and how that may inform future decisions for determining potential school site selection type of school, elementary, middle, or high school, school catchment area, and funding for a future school at Gowanus Green. Thank you. Thank you, committee. Please. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, it's great to see you. I'm Tamar Smith from the School Construction Authority, um, and I'm joined by... Hi, everyone. I'm Tori Fenton. I'm from the New York City Public Schools Office of District Planning. All right, thank you so much. All right, so um, thank you so much to the task force for inviting us tonight. It's really terrific to talk to you. Um, I have a few slides to share with you about the school at Guana Green. We are being very focused on the Guana Green uh, site, but we'll be addressing some of the issues. Leslie? Uh, Leslie brought up just now. Um, and I saw that a lot of people in this room are new to this process. Some people have probably been involved for years. Um, so bear with me if some of this is familiar. Um, and the very first thing I want to talk about is the points of agreement, as you see on the agenda. Um, then we will be talking about a general process for citing schools. Uh, a little bit about enrollment and utilization in the area right around Guanas Green. Um, recent capacity added and planned in the area, and then some next steps. All right, so here's the points of agreement. Very exciting. Um, some of you may have read through this over the years if you're interested. Also, I wanted to let you know I'll be setting some resources for people. Um, there's lots and lots of documents available for anybody who's interested in really delving into all of this data. Um, and this, rezoning points of agreement, if you want to look at that, is on the New York City, City uh, Council website and also the task force website. Um, so this is where we are. Construct a school at Guanas Green. Uh, we commit to constructing a DOE school, um, approximately 22,000 square foot parcel being reserved. Um, Elizabeth talked about the park across the street and the playground. Um, of course, the commitment is subject to a city commitment to funding the project. 
Uh, there's, right, the playground is mentioned, um, and then there'll be a safety um, plan for street traffic safety, of course. Um, and then the timeline, everybody wants to know, and it's a very fair question, as have you heard, we're a few years away from all of this. Um, and it's based on finding, uh, well, it's based on site remediation, which is really important, so I'm very excited to hear DEC's um, presentation. Um, and then, of course, subject to seat need and funding, as always. All right. So, all righty. So, the SCA general process for citing schools. Now, you'll notice I put part one, dot, 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 and that's because a, a rezoning is really very different, but I want to give an idea of what we do normally. Um, okay, so seat needs are determined by looking at the number of seats available in a subdistrict, um, and then, which is even more granular than just a school district, we look at a part of a subdistrict, um, and then how many seats are projected to be needed, and then the difference between those numbers is your seat need. Okay, and I'll be going into that in a little more detail in a couple of slides. Our capital funding for the SCA is part of the city's budget process. Uh, the SCA operates on five-year capital plans, and right now we're at the tail end of a current capital plan, which ends in, fis in June, uh, fiscal year 2024. And then we'll be starting a brand new five-year capital plan in July, uh, which will go from fiscal year 2025 through 2029. Um, so, and that's in the process right now of being approved by the city council and then the mayor. So then, once needs are identified, uh, funding is committed in the capital plan. Um, and then we look for sites. And the SCA's real estate department works with brokers across the city to look for school sites in the areas of need for purchase, to lease, uh, building an addition onto a school is another way that we do it. Um, we take information from elected officials. If they see a site, the public can call us and let us know. Uh, we work with the diocese throughout the city the Brooklyn Diocese, the Archdiocese. Developers may come forward with a plan for a site in their build, new building. We cast a wide net. Um, and sites go through, through a selection uh, process. We bring them to the community education councils and the community boards. They go to the city council and then the mayor for approval. Um, and so the general timeline, once we have found a site and either purchased it or decided on it, leased it, is about uh, a year for design, two to three years for construction, and that depends on the size of the school and um, you know the complications and all of that. Uh, so that's about the process. But part two, go on a screen. Um, for this uh, process is very different because the site was uh, procured through the, the rezoning process. We don't have to look for one, which is fantastic. Uh, and it has been approved, also great. Um, and as per the POA, various important milestones will be met before we reach school opening day. Um, site remediation and committed funding, chief among them. Okay, so a little bit about enrollment and utilization. Wait one sec. No, I wanted to go back. No, that's, that's good. All right, so a little bit about enrollment and utilization in District 15, where Gowanus Green is physically located. Um, the SCA works closely with the DOE and other agencies to review data about enrollment um, utilization every year. So the capital plan doesn't get etched in stone when it's first published. It changes constantly. We add projects, we add funding is added all the time. Um, and so when, sorry about that. Yeah, so enrollment in many districts across the city, as I'm sure many, any parents in the uh, auditorium may know, um, has been declining. And uh, this includes District 15. Um, and this started before the pandemic, but of course the pandemic had a huge effect on enrollment. Um, and, you know, New York City changes all the time. So what the SEA's challenge is, is to see things that happen demographic changes, we look at birth rates and housing starts and people moving in and out of the city. And, you know, the pandemic, we hope, was never to be repeated again and once in a lifetime, but it had a tremendous effect. 
um, and we keep on top of what happens by this constant reevaluation. So um, that's what we generally do, and I want to give you some information. On our website, the SCA website, www.nycsca.org, uh, you can take a look at not only our capital plan, but our housing projections, the, what's called the Blue Book, which is a complete overview of enrollment and utilization in every single school across the city. And there's a lot of data in there that may be of interest to people here. All right. And uh, yeah, I want to. I'll just add, you know, from New York City Public Schools perspective, as Tamar mentioned, citywide, we are coming down from a peak of enrollment from the 2016-2017 school year. So certainly predating the pandemic. And as Tamar mentioned, the pandemic certainly exacerbated some of the enrollment challenges that we've seen across the city, and in particular in District 15. Um, so we are continuing to monitor enrollment year to year. We have seen upticks in specific neighborhoods as families have either returned to the city or, you know, as Tamar mentioned, we are monitoring birth rates. We're seeing how many students uh, or school age children are living in our communities. So we are really excited about the Gowanus Green Project and about the you know, opportunity for affordable housing and housing opportunity and what that might mean for bringing families into the community. And we are also working really hard with our superintendents to ensure that we are creating robustly enrolled and sustainable schools that are able to provide everything that students you know, deserve and need in order to have a, a high quality education. Thank you. All right. So again, um, just to look even more closely at the area right around Gowanus Green. So as I mentioned, the, every school district is divided into sub-districts, and District 15 is divided into three. Uh, Sub-District 1 in Sunset Park, which is quite far from uh, the area we're talking about. Sub-District 2, Park Slope, which we're in right now. Um, and Sub-District 3, Carroll Gardens, Gowanus, Red Hook. And that's where the Gowanus Green, uh, Green site is physically located. Um, and we're very close to Park Slope as well. So on the next slide, we want to show recent seats added and planned through construction in the two subjects, uh, sub-districts closest to Gowanus Green. Now for the SCA, that's what we do. We build schools. We solve problems through construction, but it's not the only way to do that. Um, and Tori can talk a little bit more about what the DOE does to create capacity and uh, do all the hard work that they do. Um, and I want to also mention, again, just touting our website with lots and lots of data for you to look at in, uh, in detail. So uh, right here we have P the PS32 edition, which opened in September 2020 with 436 new seats. Um, PS321 is getting a new annex, uh, which is opening up this September, and that's actually in a, a diocese leased building. Um, K654, the uh, large 80 Flatbush mixed-use development, is opening in September. Um, K680 is the Harbor Middle School that's in, in design right now um, and opening in September 2027. And you see the seats added for each of these. Um, and when I say total seats, just remembering that I'm not talking about the Sunset Park subdistrict that is, is so far from here. Um, but just here, 1,820 seats added um, and planned for this area. So much more information on that take a look at our website. All right, so our next steps. The SCA will continue working with all of the agencies involved. You've heard many, many names, and that's who we're working with, HPD, of course, and um, you know, waiting on inf more information about the remediation, which we're very excited about uh, happening, and what the next steps will be after that. We'll continue to update the task force on our commitments. Um, and once remediation and other milestones are reached, we're very excited to get started on the school. And uh, we'd be happy to, and oh, Tori had some more comments. 
Yeah, just in terms of um, kind of after the school construction authority has sort of completed their next steps, um, there is a handoff over to New York City Public Schools. And, you know, one of our regular touch points with the public, with communities in District 15 is through Community Education Council 15. So we partner with CEC 15 closely so that we are able to share updates, uh, as I mentioned earlier, as we monitor data, as we're working to plan for new capacities like the 80 Flatbush uh, building that is opening with a new elementary school. We join their CEC 15 meetings. We do an annual data consultation where we share a packet of information that we update each year uh, that outlines enrollment trends, utilization of buildings, specific needs and priorities that we are seeing that we would like to develop more closely with the community. That helps inform uh, essentially our strategic plan for the district where we can think through with the superintendent where there are needs and priorities and where our office may be able to help support those needs. One way that we do that is with new capacity coming online. So for example, for PS321, a school that has been overcrowded and overutilized for a long time, now we have an opportunity to support them with you know, bringing their overcrowding issues a little bit closer under control um, and spreading those students out across a brand new, uh, newly renovated building. So for this project, you know, we are certainly a little too far out to be having those granular conversations about the best use of this school building. Uh, but when we get a little closer and when we have an opening timeline, we'll begin to have a robust community engagement process where we can work closely with schools that are in the area, you know, our nearby schools, the superintendent, CEC 15, as we think about what the best use of this new school building will be. And just uh, uh, one last thing. Once that's decided um, by our, you know, very closely partnering agency, um, that will inform a lot of the design. Obviously, different grade levels, you know, mean a different design for the building. So that will help the SCA make decisions about, you know, what it'll look like, um, what it'll hold, Great. and all the spaces inside. Great, thank you. Thank you, that was very interesting. And the thing that really um, excited some of us was hearing that you're finalizing your next five-year plan in your five-year capital budget, mm -hmm. which seems like it will overlap with the beginning, at least the design function, of the school in Gowanus. So is it safe to assume that, the, that there will be money in the capital budget in this five-year plan for this school? Right now, we, I think that there may be design uh, money funding mm -hmm. in, the, in the budget. I have to check. But if it's not there yet, it can be added. Like I was saying, um, it's a constantly changing document. So what happens is over the years, you know, let's say two, three years, this really looks like it's moving along and everything's ready to go. Um, and this would not just be for this site, but this is how we handle every site, every new school. We go to the Office of Management and Budget and say, well, there's a need here. It's all ready to go um, and we need some funding. Um, and then that's how that process works. So um, in every, I think I've been at the SCA through now, this is my second full capital plan. Um, it grows quite a bit, the, the beginning numbers, and the end, um, you know, money is added quite a lot to the end. So, yes, Thank you. that will happen. Thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna turn to the audience. Um, questions about housing, the park, school, or maybe overall agency coordination. Um, you guys can stay, and then we'll maybe do one roving mic just to stay close to the agency partners over here and then we'll have a roving bike to find you in the audience. So raise your hand if you have a question about any of the thing that you've heard so far tonight, any of those sets of commitments that you would like to ask, and we will bring you a microphone. Anybody? Okay. I will go to a note card. Question for HPD, I assume, will there be an income floor for affordable HBD units. I have never seen any units below 40% AMI, and most I see are at 130 AMI. We are a family of four, 
with two freelance working parents. And the irony is that we would never make enough money to qualify. So, but I think the question is there. Will there be an income floor for affordable HPD units? Hi. Hello? Oh, there we go. Oh, there you go. There it goes. Um, hi. So for the, um, similarly to what I went through with our programs, um, there are different distributions of AMIs that are based on various term sheets. So the term sheets are basically just the requirements for each of the different rental programs or home ownership programs that HPD has. Um, so there is a different tiers. Um, so I, there isn't really an answer that is encompassing of all HPD programs, but I'll just say, for example, with the um, building A mix and match, um, there will be different um, AMI breakdowns. Um, so as I was mentioning, there is about either 40 to 60% of those units will be for low income, and then the uh, alternative 40 to 60% would be for moderate. Um, but there are anything, like most, like what we were saying, HPD um, programs are roughly between 0 to 80% AMI, so there is not a floor per se of like what HPD has to offer, but each of the closings will have specific AMI tiers um, at that time. And so maybe when we get closer to the first closing, we can provide more information of what those AMI breakdowns will be. Um, but there is also, like I said, a set aside for homeless, um, which will be at a much lower AMI um, than, than the others. Any live question, raise your hand, please. If not, I'll continue with the note cards. Uh, question for the Parks Department, a budget. I'm sorry, right here. Why don't you wait for the microphone here? I really don't need one, but thank you. The, this area is uh, completely damaged. Why are you doing this? I'd like to know. It's not accessible. Uh, we can't handle the sewer coming out of Park Slope. Uh, the transportation is already full up. Why are you building these big, horrible buildings there? I, I don't understand it. W what is the purpose? Uh, it, it seems to be that there are going to be thousands of empty um, commercial buildings in Manhattan where you could use to bake schools, yet you're throwing away all this money on an area that could be extreme. 150 feet down below there is coal gas. You know it, and I know it. There was just a remediation that came out last week. Nobody's paying attention to it here. And I really want to know why. So it sounds like you're asking why. Why? <laughs> why? Who would like to answer that? <laughs> I think we spent a good time answering why, right? Uh, yeah. Right? I mean, that was the whole first part of the presentation. But anyone from the Gowanus Green team want to take that question about why? Uh, I think we've talked about the need for housing. We've talked about the need for parks. We've talked about the need for a school. And we'll talk about the need for remediation and monitoring after this, these questions. But if anybody wants to, uh, from the development team, uh, want to take a shot? Sure. Hi. Is this on? All right. Michael Sandler. I'm Associate Commissioner for the Office of Neighborhood Strategies at HPD. Um, I think Ben did a great job uh, starting the answer of why. I think this site um, could be a huge public amenity. Um, it's a large city-owned site in an area that will see a lot of development. By developing this site, we can, one, complete the cleanup of this site. You mentioned the environmental remediation that needs to be done on this site. Uh, completing that remediation can involve building buildings and building the new park, which will allow for capping of the site and keeping the material that are below um, from, from coming up. Uh, the city also is facing an incredible housing crisis right now. Uh, we have a vacancy rate less than 1.5%. There are not apartments available. Anyone that's looked for an apartment recently knows how exceptionally difficult it is. Uh, the Gowanus neighborhood is going to be part of the solution to our housing crisis, providing over 8,000 new apartments. 
um, thousands of new income qualified affordable apartments and this site is the centerpiece of that plan. Good. And we'll hear about remediation right in the second half in just a couple of minutes. So if you have a question about that as well, get it ready. Um, question for the Parks Department, budget inquiry. Uh, how does the New York City wide budget cuts on the Parks Department play into how funding will go into operating the park for Go On a Screen? Oh, hey, hey, can you hear me? That's a really good question. I mean, I think that we're grappling that throughout the city. Um, for, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, the budget's wo woes do change, and right now we're definitely in a downward spiral, but hope, hopefully that will change. And, you know, we, we do have other resources such as the, the bid, which will help supplement the M&O. And David, do you want to chime in on this at all? Or? Yeah. I just think that also these things come in cycles, too, so. Just introduce yourself, please. Hi there, everyone. Uh, David Yatch, Chief of Staff for Oper Operations Brooklyn. Um, these things come in cycles, so they come and go. Um, so, you know, the park that we're designing is not for just today, next year. It's for the next 30 years plus and into the future. So um, that's over. Great. Question for a non-presenting agency tonight. Uh, how is DEP planning to address construction for the Bon Lorraine sewer in light of the timeline for Gowana Green? Hey, everyone. Can you hear me? My name is Alicia Weston with the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, so our agency has been embarking on a drainage study um, f uh, focused on the Bon Lorraine sewer um, and we're currently wrapping that up and should hopefully be able to transfer that on to our partners at Department of Design and Construction for a full design plan and construction of that project. It will be a phased project, but ultimately the goals of what we're looking to do is to increase the capacity of the sewer on the west side of the Gowanus Canal um, and also reduce our dependency on any pumping, which is very energy um, sucking. I don't know. What do you want to call it? Uh, <laughs> sorry. It's been a very long day. <laughs> Taxing. Um, and uh, and that, again, that, that uh, plan will be phased. We're still working out how that will be phased, and we'll be seeing benefits um, from that ultimate uh, build out, not just um, for the Gowanus community, but also our neighbors in Red Hook. Great. Thank you, Alicia. Back to HPD. Um, has HUD funding been planned for, secured, and or expanded in connection with the development of public place to date? If not, will federal funds be used? Yeah, the, the site, so there's no HUD funding currently um, contemplated in the budget, but uh, the, the funding for this will include uh, city, state, and federal sources, including low-income housing tax credits, um, Section 8 housing vouchers, and other federal sources. Great. Question for SCA and DOE about seat need. Um, it sounds like underutilization in District 15 might prevent a new school from being built. If so, what has uh, the Department of Education and or SCA done to understand the root causes of underutilization happening at certain schools so that they become schools that parents choose to send their kids to? If you have not done that analysis, could you tell us why not? As I said earlier, New York City goes through a constant cycles of change. Uh, we do not think that any of this will prevent a school from being built at Gowanus Green. That's our commitment. Um, as for utilization, I'm going to turn it to my colleague, um, who I think may have some thoughts. Of course, we're always working with the DOE, but in terms of programming, you know, the SCA doesn't have that tough job. Um, our, our colleagues here do. I think this is a really great question, especially because we did just share that across the city and in District 15, we are seeing a decline in enrollment. We are seeing some schools that, you know, are not offering as many seats 
to students because there's less demand. With that said, it really varies by school and by neighborhood. We still have buildings in District 15 that are overutilized. We do still have a need for seats in certain areas and for certain school communities. Um, you know, we have on the macro level, um, the way that we understand what families are looking for. We have the New York City School Survey that families, students, teachers, and administration participate in. We also look to our community superintendents. Um, so here, Superintendent Alvarez, who works closely with all of the schools in the district uh, to think through you know, marketing and recruitment efforts, but also programming efforts, you know, understanding as communities shift and change, perhaps we need dual language programming, perhaps we need different kinds of special education programming. So that's happening at the school level. Um, but I think to the point here, as we think about this school building, you know, when it comes online, we don't know today what exactly the needs will be of this community. So it would be, kind of remiss of me to say we're going to open you know this type of school offering this programming because the realities of the community may be different in three five ten years from now question in the audience good, e good evening um, I have a question for DEP you mentioned that you're almost done doing your drainage study um, has it taken into account the future development of Governor's Island? Because the community's been informed that there will be a hookup from Governor's Island to Brooklyn. And I'm wondering if you took that into account doing your drainage study. You need to turn your mic on. Thank you. You can borrow the mic here, too. Okay. And will you share the final draft of your drainage study with the community? Yeah, we'll be back on the Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, back to HPD quickly. Uh, vouchers for HRA, HASA, will they be welcome? We not only ask our agency partners to come in person and update us on their work, but they must shout. <laughs> um, what height of flood are you planning for, um, i.e. 10, 10 foot flood, 20 foot flood? Does this account for rising sea levels, right? Um, and I'm assuming this bottom part says, you know, think about levels in, in, in during Hurricane Sandy. So flood level elevation taken into account in building design. Last question. Um, how many buildings that are located in a flood zone with shallow groundwater use uh, vapor intrusion technology to protect residents? And this is probably a good segue question to our, our next session. Why don't we hold it for that and that'll become the first question. Great. Any other questions before we wrap up this part of the evening? Thank you so much, really appreciate it. Thank you, and thank you for the great questions as well. Hi, I'm uh, Derek Bupp, I'm a neighborhood resident of Gowanus. Andrea Parker, Gowanus Canal Conservancy. Okay. So in the first part of this meeting, we focused on the new development that's going to be coming into Gowanus Green. And we heard a few times within there, and we've heard from all of you, that remediation is one of the steps that needs to happen before the development begins. 
Remediation has been happening on this site for a while, and it's still ongoing. So we're excited to have the Department of Environmental Conservation from the state with us tonight to tell us more about what's the status, what we can we expect in the future, how are they going to monitor it, and also this way we can ask questions and make sure that everyone understands where we are. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Patrick Foster. I am a deputy commissioner at the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, thank you to the task force for the invitation today to come and speak with everybody. Um, we are trying to take every opportunity that we can to come and speak to the Gowanus community. We um, have our own outreach events and also um, our guests of other uh, events uh, around the neighborhood. So, I hope after tonight you will keep coming to those events and keep asking questions. There's a lot going on in the neighborhood, as you all know, and a lot of it is tied to remediation and the work that um, the state is doing, along with our partners uh, at EPA and the federal government. So uh, just by way of introduction, I am an attorney um, by trade. I am not a technical person. Um, I'm going to present to you the information that I have and, and hopefully we'll be able to answer lots of your questions, um, but definitely those of the technical nature, um, we may need to defer and we'll get you answers definitely after this presentation if I don't have the information right on me. I've also worked on the canal for many years um, as an attorney for most of the upland sites. Um, before I then became the regional director of our office here in New York City. So I work for the state, but I'm a New Yorker, and I've lived here for decades and spent a lot of time in this neighborhood. I'm also the trustee um, for natural resource damages for the state of New York. So that is a complementary process uh, alongside the remediation, and I hope maybe the task force will invite all of the natural resource damages trustees to come and present on that in the future. But today, we are focused on one site um, on the Gowanus Canal. Uh, that site to us at DEC, and again, just for added clarification, I work for the state of New York, not for the city of New York, and we're DEC, we're not DEP. That's the, that's the city. We get that a lot. You guys are DEP, no we're not. <laughs> Um, so this is the Citizens uh, MGP site, MGP's Manufactured Gas Plant, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and uh, that site is now split up into two sites. Um, these numbers that are up on the screen may seem insignificant, but if you are very interested in the remediation going on in these areas, it's good to write those numbers down. Those numbers can be used to search um, through databases online to get up-to-date information, to look at reports, and get all of that technical information you may be really uh, interested in for these sites. As I said, we have a lot going on, um, the DEC in the neighborhood. It might be hard to see, but, <laughs> excuse me. This map shows um, 49, I think at this point in time, sites that DEC is overseeing in various remedial programs um, that we have at the state. And the outline there is also the outline of an investigation area for soil vapor intrusion all throughout the neighborhood that we are undertaking right now. There are three manufactured gas plant sites on the canal. The Fulton site, which is at the head of the canal. I wish I had a pointer. We don't have a pointer? No. Okay. Someone can hop on stage. There you go. And then uh, the Metropolitan Gas and Light um, site that's towards the mouth of the canal. And then this site that we're talking about today, which is the Citizens Gas Works site. Just for everyone's sake, very quickly, manufactured gas plant. What is that? What was it? Um, so we'll have a slide on that that talks about um, what a manufactured gas plant is, but it's manufacturing gas. Like it's, it's taking things like coal and other feedstocks and like if you take coal and you squeeze it really hard, you can extract the gas out of it. And as you can see, 
these sites were pretty popular at one point in time, and a lot of them are on waterfronts to get the fuel to these sites. That gas, as you'll see in, in uh, a slide that's coming up, was used the same way lots of us still use natural gas now, or methane, to heat our homes, um, and back in the day, directly for lighting, all those sorts of things. Uh, we also, excuse me, work really closely with the New York State Department of Health on all of these sites. So it's a state collaboration in between our two agencies. When I said there are various remedial programs um, that various parcels and sites are in um, around the canal, um, there's a distinction in between um, our state Superfund program and our program that's called the Brownfield Cleanup Program. The Brownfield Cleanup Program is our voluntary program. And that uh, program comes from a state law that was passed in 2003. Our regulations became effective in 2006, and that replaced an earlier voluntary program. The mission of that program is really to encourage development on brownfields instead of greenfields. So the state, as a policy position, wants to try and push development to places where development already happened, to make sure that we clean up those places and use those places instead of going to a green field. It's anti-sprawl, you can think about it that way. In that process, there's a revitalization of often economically blighted communities, because these are post-industrial communities that oftentimes, excuse me, need economic development. But of course, we are focused on the remediation. That's what my agency is focused on at this site and all over the state of New York. This is a little busy. There's a lot going on here on this slide. Some of you who are familiar with these processes have probably seen um, this before. Um, it's all over the internet in different places. And again, I need a pointer. But it starts in the upper left-hand corner there. And those blue circles that you see, those are um, public participation points within this process. So when you come into the Brownfield Cleanup Program, it's a, it starts out as a legal process. There's an agreement that happens. And then you wind your way through this process, um, doing investigation, getting approvals, for um, the investigation that has to be reported to the department, and then you move into the designing of the remedy, and then the actual action of the remedy itself, so going out into the world and digging things up or encapsulating them or doing whatever techniques um, are approved for that specific site. And then at the end of the process, when you get all the way down to the bottom there, you go through all those steps, then you get what's called a certificate of completion. This site is in the phase, generally, and it's a little complicated, and I'll talk about that in just a second, where that yellow circle is. So this site has gone through a lot of this already, and there's been a lot of opportunities for public part participation throughout that process to get to where we are right now. Here's that slide. So this just talks about MGP uh, manufactured gas plants and what they used to do. In this presentation, and you'll hear this term a lot, coal tar, um, it's interchangeable in this context with NAPL, or non-aqueous phase liquids. Um, coal tar is a type of NAPL, and coal tar is what um, was a byproduct of that process. So you squeeze that coal, let's say, and you take the gas out of it, and you're also creating tar at the same time. And that tar went into different holders and structures, and sometimes, oftentimes, they leaked. And so that tar would then get into the environment at that point. So that's the beginning of this story, of this site, really. Um, important to note, in case people don't understand this, these sites were operated by a company called Brooklyn Union Gas, which is now known as National Grid. So National Grid, because they are the corporate successor at this site, 
and many other MGP sites, has a responsibility to clean up the site. Here you can see a little bit of that legal process um, at the beginning of the Brownfield cleanup program process. In 2009, the initial agreement was signed and there were four parties on it. And that was for um, the entirety of the footprint of the MGP site, which I'll show you in just a second. And on that agreement was National Grid, and we call them a participant because they have environmental liability at this site, along with these other parties that we call volunteers because they do not have environmental liability at the site. They are developers. They're people who say, I'll go and do the cleanup there if I can then redevelop it. Um, in 2019, the site was split into two. So that's why we have two of those numbers that are going on. So there's a northern part of the site and a southern part of the site. And the northern part of the site is what we're talking about today. That's where this plan development is located. Um, and there's been some changes in, in the parties that have been involved. But since 2019, this is, this is sort of status quo. This is where we're at right now in terms of who's involved. And there is the full site. And those are, those are the two pieces that I was talking about. And you can tell after all these presentations that we've had today that we're talking about the northern piece there. C224012 is its site code. You can also see a parcel on the north there in pink, kind of pink purple for you guys. And that is also um, an off-site parcel um, from the manufactured gas plant and um, a portion of the site that we are also addressing. So the remedial history, what's happened, right? This is what, this is what you want to know, right? <laughs> what's been going on there and what's completed and what's going to go on. So site work began in 2019 after tenants left the property. So the Brownfield Cleanup Agreement was signed in 2009, and then the site work started in 2019. And that's because there were holdover tenants on this site that would not leave. And many of you are from this neighborhood and you probably remember those tenants, um, the concrete um, plant that was there. So after they left, which was an entire process, then um, site work could commence. That site work um, included excavation of known tar impacted structures. So we have old maps of where things used to be when it was an MGP. And so all of those areas were investigated. And where those structures were underground there was excavation of those structures where we saw that there was coal tar, where there was coal tar impacting those places. There was, as you have already heard, the installation of a sealed uh, barrier um, bulkhead. So this is a bulkhead wall, and that, that bulkhead is part of the remedy. There's bulkheading, obviously, up and down the canal, in many places, it's part of the remedy for those sites. Some places not. Here, it's a very important part of the remedy. And then uh, there are also collection wells. So we excavated some structures and places that had coal tar. And we also have deep wells that go down into the ground and pull up coal tar that's there. That work, that initial work, was completed in 2021. And then, in the summer of 2023, EPA issued what it's calling a matrix. And these are guidelines. These are guidelines for the state to follow when implementing the full remedies on sites. And the, that matrix from EPA says, if you're in this place and you have these conditions and you do your investigation and you find this information, these are the types of remedial technologies you should be using and these are the goals that you should have. 
So now we have this agreed upon, in between EPA and DEC, matrix that really guides what needs to happen at this site and others around the canal. After we got that in the summer, um, we had many meetings with National Grid to talk about it and to say, this is, our, this is the matrix from EPA that DEC is, is in agreement with, and so we need to do supplemental remediation beyond what was accomplished by 2021. GRID submitted a supplemental plan to us after those meetings in October. Those plans were meant to address concerns about groundwater issues. So not about the soil or people being in contact with the soil or dirt, because we're talking about deep contamination here, but we're primarily thinking about groundwater and the transfer of those contaminants that are deep in the ground because water infiltrates down and moves towards the canal. We don't drink our groundwater here, right? Our groundwater comes from upstate. Our groundwater, our drinking water, comes from <laughs> upstate. But we still care about the groundwater because it's moving contaminants, potentially. And we also don't want to um, we get this argument a lot we, from people. They say, we don't drink the groundwater, so why do we need to worry about making it clean or ensuring that it's going to be clean for future generations? And we say, because we have laws and regulations and it requires us to look at those resources and to make sure that those resources are as protected as possible. So, next, in January of this year, so things have been, I don't know if you're getting this, but things have been sort of picking up, and there's a lot of things that are happening right now. In January, um, DEC, in strong consultation with US EPA, who unfortunately is not here tonight, um, we responded to GRID's um, October letter, and we requested additional work. We said, that's not enough, we need more. And in February of this year, GRID invoked what is called dispute resolution. So we have a, an agreement, we have a legal agreement, this Brownfield cleanup agreement, and one of the provisions says if somebody disagrees with a decision that's made, they can invoke dispute resolution. And so that is what has happened at this point. That effectively stops work on the remedy. We issued a response in March, and that process is playing out right now. That's an internal administrative process. It's not in a court. It's at DEC, um, and decisions are made by people at the agency that are separated from the remediation itself, so people who are not involved with this project. What did we ask for? We wanted a proposal. We didn't ask for anything specific, but we wanted a proposal. That's how our work works. Um, you have remedial parties and their consultants who go out on the site, and um, that work that they're doing to investigate and analyze the site is overseen by the state. And so they present options to us, and then we evaluate them. That's a standard remedial process that the state goes through, the EPA goes through. So we asked for that type of a proposal. And in that proposal, we did specify for them that we wanted removal, treatment, and or containment. So maybe all of those things, right, in different places in the site. It depends on site conditions. It's the real world. All those things had to address, um, had to address the gross contamination that was impacting groundwater to an elevation of, this is technical terms, negative 23 NAVDAD, is how one says that, which is really two feet below the EPA's cap on the canal. So two feet below the bottom of the canal, the cap there. 
That's the standard, one of the standards that's in the matrix that EPA developed. These components that we asked for are not singular to this site. So we've asked this all around the canal and um, we have a lot of compliance throughout the canal from remedial parties who are doing just this type of um, supplemental um, remedial work. So as I said, it's, uh, we're in this dispute resolution process right now, but there's ongoing discussions with National Grid. Um, we're hopeful that we're gonna be able to move forward um, with the site. There's also off-site work that's happening that's still going on. So, <laughs> excuse me, on the street to the west, there's more investigation work that'll happen out there to make sure that we understand that things are not going off of the site. And then also that parcel four up into the north, we're working on getting access to that site, which has been a long haul, but we're still plugging away at it to make sure that we can um, fully investigate what's there too. There's also um, that pumping that I, that I mentioned that's ongoing, right? So everything that was happening for the initial work is still happening. And then we also allowed um, subsurface investigations on the site, um, which are really for the development itself, not for the remediation. And this is uh, sort of the end of the process that we will get to one way or another. Um, again, my agency is focused on the remediation. Um, these remedial programs have really long timelines. There's a lot of people who want it to move as fast as possible, and we understand that. Um, and we like things to move as fast as possible as well. But our dedication is to you, to the public's health, and to the health of the environment. And so um, that's where we're at with that site. There's more information here about the controls afterwards, um, after we're done. There's legal controls that get put into place um, called institutional controls. And then there's in engineering controls as well. We heard a little bit about soil vapor intrusion. Um, and uh, we can talk more about that. Um, but that's the idea that there's potentially contamination that's going to be left uh, on the site, which often happens. And uh, we want to make sure that anything that's in the soil that creates vapors, that volatilizes and creates vapors, does not get inside a building. Right? These things might be happening like all over New York, all over the country, all over the world, right? And, but they're not dangerous unless they're in a confined space. And so we need to make sure that if there are vapors that are, could potentially go into a building, that those are dealt with. That generally is like part of a development plan such as this, to make sure that the building is constructed in such a way that it's not gonna allow that to happen. And to also have potential controls on it, so if it does happen, then the systems are already in place to deal with it. Um, and then there will be additional collection of that coal tar for a very long time. And there will also be monitoring of the groundwater to ensure that, as you can see up here, you know, you can see the, the flow of ground, groundwater going in one direction. These monitoring wells then show whether or not it's moving, let's say, off-site. Um, this is a sub-slab depressurization system diagram. Um, if you haven't seen one of these before, this is just um, sort of sucking the vapors up from underneath the building and then putting them up higher in the air so they're not harming anybody. Uh, we also wanted to show a couple examples of similar manufactured gas plant sites. New York City is definitely not alone in having these um, old legacy industries in uh, places where people live and want to redevelop. So um, this is like 15 of them that we pulled up that have multifamily homes and parks and things that are similar. And the ones that are bolded there real quick, in Terrytown, there is this development that's on the Hudson River, um, multifamily housing, um, very, very similar in terms of what was um, in the ground that had to be remediated. In the Bronx, Starlight Park is a former MGP site. And this site is at the confluence of the Susquehanna and Chenango Rivers. 
and flooded, I didn't put the flood picture on here, but this entire area would be flooded all the time, right? But because of the remediation and the redevelopment of this site, they have these resiliency measures um, in place. And this is now student housing. So this is me. There's some information that's there, and I can point you to lots of other places where you can get information as well. Patrick, thank you. Uh, committee, one question. Thanks, Patrick. Um, can you expand on who is responsible for the monitoring and engineering controls long term? Yeah. So um, the remedial parties are responsible for the monitoring. Um, when a, one of those controls, I said that there's legal controls and then there's engineering controls. One of those controls that we put on the site, um, the institutional controls, is called an env environmental easement. And that's a property interest that the site owners have to give to the state of New York. They have to give to all of us. And that property interest says that anybody in perpetuity, whoever owns this site, has to follow what we call as the site management plan. And that site management plan provides for the monitoring of the site. So anybody who is in control of that site, who owns that site, has to make sure that um, that site management plan is fulfilled. So usually if there's like a transfer from one entity to another after the Brownfield cleanup agreement, that's part of the transfer agreement. But we don't get involved in those things. We just get involved in enforcing if somebody doesn't follow it. Great. Here and note cards, everybody, if you have them, please write, put them in the air and we'll, we'll collect them and we will ask the questions. Hello. Thank you for that presentation. I understand the EPA also has a responsibility to monitor the migration, you know, what comes into the canal that they remediate, I think, in perpetuity. Is this something that you will, does, will you coordinate with EPA on the future monitoring? Yeah, so the EPA will definitely, you know, uh, maintain their interest on the remedies that the state has overseen all uh, throughout the canal. So that information will be continuously shared with EPA for sure. Hmm. Uh, here, in the front row. Um, why did it take EPA so long to make the matrix? I don't understand. Um, well, they're not here, and I, I can't um, answer for them. I think that there, there's lots of forums also that you can talk to the EPA. There's a regular um, community advisory group meeting um, that many people here maybe join or, or know about, um, where I think if you pose that question to them, they can answer um, it more fully than than I could. Well, we invited APA tonight. They, unfortunately, they had a conflict. They had a Newtown Creek CAG. But if there are questions for EPA, and we've already collected them over info at GowanusTaskForce.net, um, we will ask them as well, and they've, uh, they'll be happy to answer too. And this one is for the state. Uh, you know, the governor was in Gowanus a few days ago. And she wanted to go easy on some of the environmental uh, Thanks. So, could you sort of, uh, you know, expl you know, say something about that? And secondly, like, you know, when we'll have a new president, you know, is there a few things he can go easy on or like hard on? Yeah. So, um, I'm not going to speak for my boss either. Um, <laughs> I'm an appointed uh, state official. But, uh, but I, I can tell you that the, the standards that we follow are in the law and in regulation. Um, and there, there's, there's maybe obviously like discretion that's, that's in there and, and, but we're very, again, very focused in my agency in ensuring that the, the primary goals and targets that are in those laws, which is the protection of public health and the environment, um, are met. And so we'll do everything that is necessary before you get to the point where somebody gets a certificate of completion. In terms of the federal government um, and the change in um, potential presidents, is that what you're asking? Um, <laughs> we, 
We, we're the state and, and uh, we definitely rely on federal funding in many of our programs, but um, we also have a, a state super fund um, that is funded by New Yorkers, which is really ro robust. Um, and, uh, you know, across administrations, the other thing to understand about us as an agency and all these other agencies as well is that we're public servants. So regardless of who's in political control, um, we have a lot of lifelong folks who carry out the missions of our agencies. So you can expect that to stay the same. Question that came in over email, uh, for how many years will these proposed buildings in the school at Public Place need to be monitored for toxic vapor intrusion? So, un <clears throat> I don't have a number um, because we're, we're not finished with the remedy that's there, so we don't know exactly what's gonna happen, like how much is gonna be excavated, how much might be solidified, there's different things that are acceptable to do under certain circumstances, but one can imagine decades. Remedial programs have monitoring generally that go on for decades. So if you come to DEC as like a fresh engineer and you, you get a site, you're gonna have it for the rest of your career at, at DEC. You're not gonna let it go. Um, I have a follow-up question to my earlier one, which is your certificate of completion, is that for the entire site or is it possible to that the HPD program is phased? Is there a possibility to have a phased completion? Yeah, so, so we have a strong preference for um, maintaining holistic sites um, because we think about it as like one entire remedy for one place that had similar things happening. But as you saw, we have already split this site into two pieces and there are other mechanisms that we use. We use these things called operable units to address pieces at, at one time. But the short answer is yes, it's possible, um, but that's a case-by-case -case analysis, and it's driven by the science of what needs to happen on the site. Um, question here, yep. Um, about the long-term control plan, like, imagine a school is there, and then we know the public health risks of the coal tar that's there, and we know that the coal tar recovery wells are gonna be pumping out coal tar. Can you talk a little bit about what that might look like for the community? Yeah, so uh, oftentimes what um, people who are building new buildings will do is that they will put the systems underneath the building that they may need in case there is some sort of an issue. And then there, there would be built into um, you know, the, um, the process like monitoring of indoor air quality, for example, and that might be heightened depending on different uses. So if you have like an industrial use or something or, or a commercial use where people are not gonna be like living or in a place for you know, so many hours, you might have a different regime. So uh, you know, I, I don't know what that's gonna look like, but if there is, if there would be some sort of potential problem then, like if there was a crack in a foundation or something at some point in time, as I said, usually a, de a developer will make the decision to put the infrastructure into, um, you know, underneath the building so that they can then um, just sort of hook up a system to make sure that those vapors are not entering the building anymore. I mean, we don't, um, as part of the remedial process, you know, the, the targets that are, are, are being uh, met do have like broad use categories, but the, the remedy itself um, does not generally contain that infrastructure. So somebody could sort of like do that at risk, but then they might have to spend a lot more money later to like put in that sort of system, which is kind of what what might be happening, you know, in different parts of the neighborhood. Mm. Uh, quickly, I know we're running out of time, but uh, a request from the audience. Can we go back to the examples of the former NGP sites? And I assume there will be a follow-up question from somebody who made this request. Which one do you want? Oh, this one. Yeah, sure. 
developer is going to be involved in the remediation as well. Did I hear that correctly? So and the, develop, the development, um, the question is, will the developers be involved in the remediation as well? Yeah, so you can see who's on the BCA right here. So on the agreement, so um, some of those are on the Gowanus screen team, right? So in that way, yes, are legally involved. Um, and uh, their sort of group agreement about who's undertaking the remediation on the site is their, their decision. And the state does not care which one of them or if all of them complete the remediation as long as they complete the correct remediation. The, it's generally a developer in the Brownfield Cleanup Program who is conducting the remediation. And it's, it's really to their interest that they do the best job that they possibly can. These sites, um, these sites carry environmental liability. You know, it's hard to get financing on a site that has contamination, and it's understood that a lot of money has to go into these sites to make them viable for redevelopment. Nobody wants to go back after they're like, they've gotten their COC, their certificate of completion. And there are situations where even if you get a COC, like if we have new information, we'll tell you, you have to go, go back out and do more. Nobody wants to do that. They want to be done. I mean, not to speak for developers. Question here. It's a microphone here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in 2019 or 2020 to go to 100% affordability was followed some of that testing and whether there are different standards for testing for the affordable housing. Um, I don't think residential just residential standards. I can't answer that. Sorry. What are those entities? They're like limited liability companies that were formed by humans. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're corporations. So if you, if you um, and this is all like publicly available information and it's extremely available, there's a site called DEC Info Locator which is, I think, a super fun or maybe just interesting <laughs> site that <laughs> is, a mapping, is a mapping site. Um, so it's a GIS site. And it shows you all sorts of information about uh, environmental quality in your neighborhood or wherever you know, your parents live in Schenectady or <laughs> whatever, all across New York State. So you can go to DEC Info Locator, for example, and like click on environmental remediation, and it'll show on the map this site, for example. And if you click on that site, it'll then give you a link to all of these documents. So it'll give you a link to like the remedial investigation report that was done in uh, 2019 or 2020. It'll give you the um, remedial action work plan that detailed like all of the things that I was talking about in terms of what the, the remedy had in it. It'll show you the Brownfield cleanup agreements. So you'll see the names of these entities. All of that is public information and it's like clickable. It's very, very easy to access. I'm going to reshape the question that was asked here previously. Just, I don't know that everybody understands if there's different standards for remediation for uh, residential versus industrial versus commercial. There are. Um, so the, we have these things called soil cleanup objectives um, that tell remedial parties like um, what values they have to meet when they're doing their uh, remediation. So those soil cleanup objectives are different dependent on what the end use is of the, of the site. So sorry, it threw me the affordability part of it, threw me a little bit on the question there. Um, and that because residential would be one of those categories. Um, you, they go from all the way from unrestricted where you have to meet a soil cleanup objective where you could like eat food, you know, like plant food in it, up to industrial. 
which is if it has an industrial use, then it, it doesn't need to be as clean as it would need to be if people were going to live on it. Question here? Good. Just use the mic here, please. I had a question about timeline. So, I, I mean, I know you're in arbitration, but uh, I mean, how, about how much longer is there in this process? So, um, where there's a will and where there's money, there's a way. Um, lots of things can be done quickly um, if people agree to do them and they put resources towards them. As you saw, the site wasn't actually available in 2019, and there was a, sub a substantial amount of work that was done by 2021, right? That included that like highly engineered bulkhead wall, um, those deep wells that are extracting things, and lots of excavation that happened on the site. So, you know, I d we don't know, as you said, because we're in this process, what is going to be required but I think there's lots of people that are hopeful that you know we'll get to an agreement of what needs to be done there and um, kick it in, into gear and, and, and move forward. George, yeah, we're a little over time, but yes, please. Yeah, did the national, did the dispute with National Grid, does that delay things a little bit? Uh, yeah, it does, yeah. I can, play, I can play that out for you. You guys want to know the timing on that? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> not, not everybody wants to know it, probably in the room, but, but uh, yeah, so this is the first level of the dispute resolution process that we're in right now because it was just invoked, and um, we will, if we, if we keep moving forward in that process and we don't have an agreement, then we'll have a first level decision probably by June-ish. And then let's just say somebody doesn't win that, um, they would have the opportunity to then appeal that internally. And so we would start sort of over doing the same thing. Um, and there could be twists and turns along the way. Um, so it, as any sort of legal or quasi-legal process, if it, hopefully not everybody's been involved in one, but if you have, you know um, that they can go in lots of different directions and they can take a lot of time. Other questions? We're here. Yeah, please. Can you hear me? I think you just talk. Here we go. Yep. Hi. Yeah. Patrick, Hi. thank you for your update. Um, you mentioned the parcel north of Public Place. Um, you didn't mention the fact that that is currently in the state Superfund site program. Um, and you may not be aware, but Members of the community have been recently made aware that um, migration off that site of MGP, former MGP toxins, have migrated off the site near a church and school on the corner, and that's been detected by National Grid's contractors in their post-remediation study. I'm curious, who is responsible for remediating the toxins that have come off the site, first of all, and then I have a several other questions. So uh, National Grid is um, that, that um, category of participant uh, that I was noting, that, so they're different from the developers. That means they have the obligation to chase contamination going off site. So it is, it is their obligation is my understanding. And um, I think that they, they would have already addressed it if they would have been able to gain access. Access can be a very tricky issue in our business. Um, but well, to be more specific, we're aware that National Grid and DECs has known that high levels of toxins have been in that monitoring well for over two years. And you've, been a you've not been able to gain access to that site for over two years. And the EPA Community Advisory Group has asked EPA to get involved, but uh, we've been told that they're working collaboratively with you, gaining access. And I think the community should be concerned about the migration of these toxins off the former MGP site. So as I was saying, the access issue can be a sticky widget. Um, there, there are processes that can be undertaken that are more, uh, I think, fully legal. 
that we are always considering. Um, but as I was just saying, those processes then can last a very long time. Um, the EPA and the DEC will continue to, to work to ensure that that site is fully cleaned up. Um, but right now, there is a little bit of an impasse that can we're working you, can through. Can you help the audience understand why that site was made a Superfund site, a state Superfund site, as opposed to the other three parcels in the Brownfield program? I don't have a history on that, frankly. Okay. okay. I have a process question that I think everybody in this audience should be aware of. Since there might be a new remediation plan put forward for public place or the entire MGP site for that matter, what process will citizens like us have to review that and actually participate in the discussion of that remediation site? And more importantly, will the plan be subject to the New York State Environmental Quality Review Act and the New York City Environmental Review Act or any other environmental review processes? Right, so environmental review um, is required for projects that are happening um, where you need permits or is there some other discretionary decision by um, an agency. And uh, the projects that are gonna be happening at the site are definitely gonna have to go through Seeker. But the, um, the remediation itself is an environmental cleanup process. Um, so it does not go through seeker by law. Okay. So the, you're asking about the, the process right. up here. So um, we'll go back to um, that the closest blue circle to the yellow circle. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a board game. Go, go back there, and there'll be opportunity for the uh, public to comment at that point. Mm -hmm because it'll be a supplemental remedial action work plan, and that will be publicly noticed. And if people want to make sure that they have an opportunity to, oops, did I mess that up? To uh, know when that comes out and where, where, when that is issued, I mean, it'll also be announced at the CAG and lots of places where people here are involved. But you can sign up for updates at um, our website, DEC Delivers, and there's the website right there, or you can just put in New York State uh, DEC Delivers, and you can sign up for our newsletters, and so you can get ups updates about the site there. Okay. Last question. Um, do you happen to know if the development plan will be subject to New York State's Climate and Community Leaders Protection Act? So any permits that would be necessary for any development or any activity in New York State that are covered under the CLCPA, the Climate Act, um, have to go through a, an analysis, a, a, a CLCPA analysis. And who but does those that are, analysis? But those are only certain permits that are, that are covered, and I don't know this by any stretch of the imagination. Do I know the scope of permits that this um, project would, would need? And do you happen to know who does that review? Uh, my, our, our agency would do that review. Okay. So th those much. are the types of permits like for, well, anyway. Great, no, we're gonna have to make that State the permit. last question of the night. And, and uh, just remember, if you didn't get to ask one, write it down. You could still send it to info at GowanusTaskForce.net. But I just wanna thank Patrick, thank our, all our agency partners, <laughs> thank the task force. This is, this is really the way that our government is supposed to work, to come and engage and help us highlight issues that we can help solve. So thank you all for coming and participating oh, one more thing, in that process. One more thing, thank one more you. thing, one more thing. There, we wait a minute, Patrick. Wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry. There's, you can see on the slide here, I just want to point it out, join us. There, there'll be an, uh, a Gowanus area-wide availability session in June. So get on that list and you'll get the information about that session. And then you can actually talk to the engineers who are working at Public Place and any other site and you can ask them all those technical questions that I can't answer. Great. Thanks everybody. And, and we'll send out a reminder when the full question and answers are ready to be posted to the website and the recording as well. But thank you everybody. Stay safe, stay dry.